Hi. Hi, Ariel. How are you? How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, so thank you so much for your time and taking your time to do this interview. Um, can you start by introducing yourself and telling us a bit about like yourself? Absolutely. So my name is Heather Murphy Caps. I am an author of middle grade books. I write fiction and nonfiction. I prefer fiction. I like making up stories. Yeah, same. Uh, so of course it's a, it's a great place to live, right? Um, in made up stories, my stories are mostly a blend of historical fiction and contemporary, uh, but I also do use magical realism, and I also have stories that have a science theme to them as well. So those are some of the things that I like to write about. And uh, Indigo and Ida, which is the book that we'll be talking about today, which is right here over my shoulder, uh, that is my first published fiction book. It's not the first book I ever wrote, but it is my first published fiction book. Yeah, yeah. So that's a little bit about me. Um. So what inspired you to become a writer? So I actually, and I think this answer is probably something you hear from writers all the time. We're not very interesting on this. I've always wanted to be a writer. Uh, I, I wanted to be a writer when I was your age, even younger. The very first book I ever wrote, actually, was The Adventures of Pink and Purple, which my little sister illustrated. It was a detective novel. And we wrote it on real paper and folded it over and stapled it for a binding. Um so I always wanted to be a writer. I, I didn't start writing books right away in my career, but I spent a whole lifetime writing lots of different kinds of writing. Oh, wow. That's a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what inspired you to write Indigo and Ida? So I knew that I wanted to write a story about a girl who was dealing with friendship issues. Um, that's mm -hmm. one of the themes I write about a lot is friendship and um, making friends that help you be somebody that you want to be, help you be somebody you're proud of, making friends who support you and who you feel you can support. Um, that's always a really important theme for me. So I was inspired to write Indigo and Ida because I wanted to tell a story of a girl who was in middle school and was trying to figure out who were her real friends and who were the friends that maybe weren't doing such a great job at being good friends to her. The story definitely um, explained that. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you that you saw that and that you felt that because that was really one of my primary goals. I have a lot of different things that were going on, but that was one of the first ones. And uh, and so yeah, that that was part of it. And then, of course, since you've read it, you know that I also wanted to write a story about a girl who was a journalist, a girl who was trying to learn how to use her voice to tell her own truths, and a girl who was running for political office. So what's going on with Indigo, right? That's like a huge mess. Well, very yeah. often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how did you come up with the title? So I came up with the title because uh, the main character is Indigo, of course, and her, uh, the other sort of main character is Ida B. Wells, who was a famous journalist from the 19th century. And the whole plot revolves, or I shouldn't say the whole plot, but as you know, part of the plot revolves around these letters that Indigo finds that were written by Ida B. Wells. And it's a lot about their friendship that occurs or that develops with just Indigo uh, learning about Ida and feeling a real connection to her. So it's the whole story about Indigo and Ida and their connection. Mm -hmm. Well, so when I first looked at the title of the book, I thought that the that Indigo was emailing it and I thought that Ida was writing a letter. I thought they lived in two different places and were friends. <laughs> it's You know what? I could see why you thought that because part of the cover has Indigo with her laptop. So I totally see why you thought that. And then the top part with Ida, she's got her pen and she's writing. So so then when you found out that she was reading letters that Ida had written a long, long time like, ago, what? what did you think? I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a twist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was no, 
There and was also, no email when Ida was around. Um, also, when I saw the cover, I thought that Ida was the one who was, well, in my case, typing an email. And Indigo is the one who was writing the letter. You know, that's so interesting that you say that, Ariel, because that's that what person. my sister said, too. Yeah, because the names are next to that person. I, I, I've heard people say before, my sister said, well, why didn't they put the names next to the person instead of, you know, under the person? I don't know. That that actually didn't occur to me until she said it. So I think it's interesting that you observe that, too. It's definitely something to keep in mind if I ever have a cover that looks like this again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is Ida based on an actual person or is she, was she an actual person? She really was. Yeah. Ida B. Wells was a real journalist. She was born in 1862. So she was actually born before the end of the Civil War, which means that as a Black American, she was born enslaved uh, and she didn't get to be free until the end of the Civil War. Um, a long time. Yeah, well, she was just a couple of years old, but it really, you know, those are those were some really interesting times that she lived through and they shaped who she was. So ultimately, she became a journalist because she lived through the time that was called Reconstruction, when it seemed like maybe black and white people could be on equal footing after the end of the Civil War. Um, but then it turned out that we had to go through a pretty rough period of time. Uh, where there were these laws called Jim Crow laws that really restricted Black people, African Americans in America, didn't let them uh, vote or or be on equal footing with white people. So those were things that she wrote about as a journalist. Mm. Well, that that's really sad. But I mean, especially the fact that she's also a woman. So I mean, it was hard for women there too. Really sharp observation, Ariel. Yes, she was a woman and she was a journalist. And here's what's amazing to me about her. I will always be amazed by how brave she was. It wasn't a very welcoming space for her to be a woman who wrote about really serious topics at a time when women really weren't invited to write about serious topics or taken very seriously when they wanted to talk about those topics. I mean, women couldn't even vote back then, right? So, so she did it anyway. And to be an activist and a journalist during those times when African-Americans had very few rights and uh, were were really looked on um, terribly, uh, to put it mildly, was a really brave act of courage for her. It was. I mean, well, at least she paved a path for a lot of the women since then, because then now a lot of people, a lot of women especially, and African-Americans too, have have better rights, which is which is good for the entire country and all all race of color. Absolutely. Very well said. Astute observation. We are grateful to her because of the path she forged for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever witnessed racism? Yes, unfortunately, I have. Uh, as a brown person in America, I'm biracial. So uh, I have uh, a Black mother uh, who I have witnessed receiving racism, and I myself have received racism and microaggressions in this country. So that's an unfortunate truth. Oh, well, at least it's better now. It's getting better. We have to keep fighting for it. We have to keep working on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So is my tube a real thing? <laughs> no, <laughs> I was pretending uh, I couldn't I can't use the real YouTube because that's a name that actually belongs to the company. Yeah, I think so it's I can't write something. a book where I make money on it. So I made up my tube. <laughs> My tube. I actually thought my tube was a real place. <laughs> Good. I'm glad it was convincing. <laughs> it was. It was. And I even think the other day before I read the book, one of my classmates said something about, um, I have a channel on my tube, but I must have heard that wrong. Oh, that's so funny. Well, I mean, maybe there's such thing as it now. I don't think there is, but who knows? Or maybe they just said my tube accidentally instead of YouTube. Who knows? Yeah. Are there any interesting or memorable experiences that happened in your life that that influenced into the book other than, well, what you already talked about? So, yeah, you know, one of the things that was really interesting for me about writing this book was that I actually wrote it during COVID. 
I had started the idea. I had the idea sort of percolating in my head. I had been thinking about it for a long time, really. Um, but then by the time I really started to get ready to write it and I was ready to do a lot of research, the pandemic happened oh, and no. all of a sudden I couldn't go to libraries anymore. And I was going to go to the Library of Congress because I really wanted to see some documents that were there. And I didn't get to do that. So that was a really interesting period of time where my research was limited to what I could see online. But here's the great thing that I was really delighted to find out. And that is that she was uh, such, she did so much writing. She did so much newspaper article writing and she wrote pamphlets and she even wrote her own autobiography that I was able to either buy things from the from online bookstores or just see things digitally online in different libraries. So it oh. was a really interesting experience to research it in those conditions. Yeah. Who knew? I was really shocked when you said no library. <laughs> yeah. Because okay. for me, like, the library is, like, almost like my only research to get books. Right. I know. I know. And so, you know, I think we're really lucky that we yeah. – have a time now where libraries have digitized so many books and there's audio books now and you can mm. get things that have been scanned. I don't can't imagine having had to go through all that and you know trying to research a book like this 20 years ago or even oh. more than that when I was your age it would have been impossible. Yeah. Yeah, well that that actually does sound impossible. How, can you tell us about your process of writing the book? Sure. So, um I think that you know, I was telling you, I was, uh, I did a lot of research first mm -hmm. and um, l let me, I'll back up a little bit and I'll tell you that uh, one of the, the things that got me going on writing it um, was actually a song. The whole book, believe it or not, the whole book began with a song about the astronomer Galileo. As you oh. probably know, Galileo was a guy who just threw everybody for a loop when he said, wait a minute, you've got it all wrong, right? It's not the sun going yeah. around the planets. It's the planets going around the sun. He even got thrown in jail. He got thrown in jail, right? Which and there... we can learn by reading the book. Also. I... Yes, yes. And so, um, so there's this song that talks about Galileo. And that was actually my inspiration, one of my inspirations, in addition to wanting to write about friendship. And I thought, I want to write about someone who tells the truth and gets in a little bit of trouble for it or or gets a little bit of flack. Yeah, because that's sort of what um, Indigo did. She told it's, the truth and she got in lots and lots of trouble for it. But not right. as much as Galileo. Not as much as Galileo, right. She yeah. didn't get thrown in jail, right, exactly. But she did get some, you know, she caught some flack from her friends or people who mm -hmm. she didn't know if they were her friends. Um, but that's kind of where it all started was with a song about Galileo. And that song, the, the, the singing group that actually sings that song, the name of that singing group is called the Indigo Girls. Yeah. So that's how I got Indigo's name was from the group that sings that song that gave me the idea to talk about a girl who was trying to tell the truth. Yeah, they even um, talk about that band in the book. Yes, I do. I do. You're right. Wow. You have such a good memory when you're reading so yeah. many books. It's easy to lose track of details, but that was True. really good. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the process. I thought about that. I thought about her. I, I had a character. I had Indigo. I knew where she was going to live, Minnesota, which is where I grew up. I knew she was going to be a journalist because I was a journalist. That's something that we were going to talk about at some point. Um, and then I didn't know what else to do with the book. I needed a plot. And so it wasn't until I realized something really important about Ida B. Wells. And that was that Ida B. Wells had had some really difficult friendship moments. And she had had a moment where one of her friends kind of threw her under the bus and told her that um, during a really big march protest march trying to get the women's vote they told her that even though she helped them get a lot of women to do the protest march that yeah, she had to walk back. in the back yeah you read that, that was, right that was, yeah that yeah. was really unfair when i i like this book almost had me like at the verge of tears oh oh my gosh i mean i you know what well i mean the makes... first time actually i mean yeah I thought I, I'm glad that you connected so much with it, actually. I'm very, I'm moved by that, that it connected with you. But uh, and I'm glad. 
Yeah. So you can imagine how much that hurt her. And that's what I was imagining. And that's sort of where the book really got going. Because then I thought, okay, I'm going to write this book about these connections between these two characters. Um, and then the process was really about outlining a book. It gets really, you know, sort of cut and dried about writing. Then you, I yeah. outline my books, I write them, and then I have to revise them a ton of times. And that's what I did. I revised a lot. Did you have an editor or did you do the revising? I did the revising all by myself at first. And then at that time, I didn't have a literary agent. So I actually entered a writing contest. Unfortunately, the contest doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, there was a writing contest where you could get a mentor. So then my mentor edited with me. And then I had some other writing friends who edited with me. And then I was lucky enough that uh, my literary agent that I found really liked it. She wanted to sign with me and I edited again. And then she sold it to a publisher. And once I had a publisher who acquired it, that's what happens. They acquire the book. Yeah. And then I had an editor and I did the last couple rounds of editing with my editor before it finally hit the bookshelves. Well, that's a lot of editing. It's a lot of editing. Yeah, it really is. I think you said it at least six to seven times. It was actually 10. I kind of cut some out just to keep it short. Now, in the future, I won't have to edit quite as many times because at that point I was going through this contest. So there were a couple extra layers built in that I won't have again. But six times is not unusual. Yeah. Yeah. So what message or theme do you hope readers learn from this book? So a couple of different things, you know, I've talked a lot about friendship. And so that's the first one that I'll start with. I really hope that, um, that people who read this book will think a lot about what a good, what, what the value of a good friendship, a good friend and friendship is, and will value themselves enough to seek out good friends. You know, mm -hmm. I think that um, when you have friends that boost you up and help you be the best person you can be and and for whom you can do that too, that shows not only that you uh, have friends that value you, but that you value yourself enough to know that you deserve good friends. So that's one thing I really hope readers will get from this book. And then another thing is something that actually you mentioned yourself, and that is just, uh, you know, knowing how important it is to understand what people have done before we came along, forging right. paths like Ida B. Wells did. She did a lot of work to get her voice out there about inequality, about uh, racism, about the women's vote. She was an activist and a journalist, and she really did a lot of work to try to point those things out that aren't working so well for us in our society. And when we know all of those things, then we can take that work and carry it forward ourselves. Yeah, well, that's a really important lesson. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So if you could give one advice, piece of advice to kids who are just becoming authors, what would it be? Oh, you know, I would definitely say to do what you're doing, which is read a lot and also write a lot. I think that you can just... Uh, you know, the, the most important thing to do is that practice. And there are some people who say you have to write every single day. I actually am not one of those people. I don't think you have to write every day. I think some days it's just enough to let things sort of rumble around in your head and, and think about stuff. So I don't write every day. I'm busy. I have a I have two children. I have a job where I teach during the day. I teach grownups oh, nice. how to write. Um, yeah, so I have a lot going on. And so there are days when I feel like I'm more productive if I just think about maybe what my plot holes are or uh, how to develop my character better or, you know, any of those kinds of things that help shape a book that um, that carry me further in my goal of getting a book written. So I would pass that along to every writer to say, don't feel like you have to write every day. You can think about it every day. You can work and plan and consider, um, but then also do keep writing and do keep reading. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if like technically, if you think about it, and I've told other authors this too before, you read every day. 
even I, if even if like all you do is drive around all day, you read the signs every day. So if you could go back in time and give yourself advice at any point of life, then what would it be? Oh my gosh. I think that um I don't I don't think there's anything that I would change about the way my career developed, but what I would tell myself is that it's okay to uh, to change my mind about things that I want to do. You know, writing is not actually my first career. When I first graduated from college, I actually went to East Africa to teach English in uh, in a high school there. And while I was in East Africa teaching, I I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I realized when I was teaching that I'm really a storyteller. So when I came back from Kenya, that was the country I was living in, um, I applied to schools to get a different degree to be a journalist. And then I was a journalist for 15 years before deciding I wanted to be a writer. And every time I change my mind about something I want to do, or I just decide not really changing my mind, but I decide to move in a different direction, that can be a little scary. So I think I would tell myself that it's okay that changing my path is growing my whole personality and growing my life and that it's okay to do more than one thing with your career and your lifetime. Hopefully you'll get to do lots of different things and grow your mind and your talents in different ways. So I think that's what I would tell myself. That was that was very well spoken. And um, I mean, well, I feel like that would be a very useful advice to a lot of people. In fact, like, um, for example, I don't know, maybe... Maybe someone who's been struggling with their job and doesn't want to change because they're thinking it's going to be too hard or something. Yeah, yeah, I would hope so. I mean, I think sometimes we we feel like once we make a decision, people are going to hold us to it and they're going to say, okay, this is what you said you are. You have to just keep sticking to that. But, you know, life is long and it's more interesting if you get to explore lots of different things as long as you're, you know, making sure that you've got food on the table and a roof over your head. <laughs> so are you, what do you want to be? Are you going to be uh, a writer one day? I want to try and be a writer, but I, like you were, I also like, like after I wanted to become a writer, um, I thought maybe I could also do journalism because mm -hmm. number one, it just feels exciting. Yes, it is exciting. And you get yeah. to travel and mm -hmm. write. And mm -hmm. that's like my two favorite things almost. Whenever yeah, we you go know, on family trips, it's like, I love it. Well, I think that you'd be a great journalist because you're outgoing and you are interested in people and you're interested in stories. And that's really what news is. You're telling the story of people's lives. You're telling them the things that will help them make decisions about their lives and their homes and their families. Uh, and it is exciting. You get to travel. You get to meet people. Uh, you get to be involved in living history, which, of course, is fascinating. Yeah, it is very fascinating. So you earlier you said that you were a journalist. Have you, like, any time, like, visited any places when you were a journalist? Or? I, I was lucky enough to do a lot of traveling as a journalist. I think some of the most notable places were uh, that I went to London and spent some time there getting... Um, working for one of my, I worked for CBS News and we have a bureau. And so I worked for CBS News and our bureau there uh, for a little bit of time. And then during the time when this country was uh, going to war in Iraq, I was one of those journalists who was what they call embedded, which means they put us in the middle of some of the troops that were involved in that war. And so uh, I was actually on some Navy ships. And then I was also in Cyprus in between times on the Navy ships. They they had the That's journalists exciting. who were embedded living there and then going out on different ships. Yeah. So that was that interesting. Was so it was very interesting. Exciting. And that's very brave of you to do that. I mean, because if you're going on a ship, that's, well, I would say a warship, yeah. which, like, that's actually, that's crazy. <laughs> but I admire your bravery. I admire it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was definitely, um, 
it was definitely a really big experience, a growing experience, learning experience. Of course, nothing like the people who were involved in doing uh, that that work themselves and very different from the people who were on the ground. You know, I was on a ship, so I wasn't necessarily right in the middle of it, but all of it was, um, you know, that was really valuable to see all of those things happening and um, and to be able to talk to the women and men who were involved in that um, in that conflict. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's uh, that's that's a very that's a very privileged opportunity. And um, I've also seen reporters who are you know embedded in situations, too, because once when I think it was I was watching this thing on Epic, like I told you about earlier, um, it was this um, hurricane video about hurricanes because, I mean, there were a lot of hurricanes in 2023, and so I got all worried, and I started looking up hurricanes, and so um, so, but when I watched it, he was in the middle of the storm and the roof on that, I don't know, that's some sort of platform that he was on, got blown off. Oh, wow. And Very there was, scary. There was, there was hair, I mean, there was water all over him, and it was actually it was it was it was scary looking yes but it was also pretty funny because at one point um turns out he had actually really long hair and his hair came down at one point <laughs> and <laughs> the water made a stream all over his face. <laughs> Not very glamorous at that point. <laughs> so what do you enjoy doing for fun? Yeah, you know I what I I do like to travel, and I like to uh I big I told you that I've got kids and so they are both athletes and I like to go watch their sports I find that fun I nice. like to hang what out with my friends play? baseball and softball ah yeah softball yeah. is interesting I think it's so really too interesting yeah I mean, I'm so glad that you like it? it I that's a really good question I have no idea I can't even believe yeah. I've never even tried to find out I just never found out but I love it it's exciting okay. So, look, there's less than a minute left in the time. So, um, thank you so much for your time with this interview. Um, I really enjoyed speaking with you today. And